Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Wednesday Night Photo Show. We've got a good one for you tonight. We've got a bunch of special guests and all kinds of cool photography to take a look at. I'm here tonight with Phil. I'm gonna give yourself a little introduction over there. Coming to you live from Dan's Camera City. I don't think we can quite hear you. I think something went a little funny with your microphone over there. But we've got a bunch How's of that? stuff. Is that a little better show. for you? That's better. Now I can hear you. There we go. Hi, everybody. Excellent. Good evening. All right. So this week's show is all about macro and close-up photography and some winter projects. Normally, we kind of think of macro. We tend to fall into thinking about macro in terms of flowers or bugs or, you know, when we're outside in nature, that sort of thing. And I don't think macro necessarily gets enough credit in the winter. The fun you can have with it either outside in the winter or maybe inside if you don't want to go out and deal with the muck and the cold. Uh, so we've got a bunch of great stuff for you tonight. Um, Phil, I believe we also got some macro stuff going on in the store. Yeah, we, uh, we're we going to show a bunch of pictures tonight. Uh, the other guests are going to show some as well. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about the ways that we got some of those pictures as much as we can fit into the time here and uh, talk about some of the techniques and some of the things that uh, you probably already have or that you might need to make things happen. And that's for both, as Scott was saying, both indoor and outdoor stuff, whether it's really cold weather, somewhat cold, or as we ease into the spring, some of the other fun things you can do. Yeah, and uh, this kind of kicks off our macro and close-up photo sale. We kind of thinking, kicking around ideas for, okay, what can people do in the winter when maybe there's not as much light or it's a little gross out? Uh, and like, let's play around with macro and close up and stuff. So we've got a bunch of specials going on that we're going to kind of highlight a few items from as well. So Excellent. we're going to get started with our first guest, a friend of ours that we uh, I has saw some of her work posted in our Facebook group. And I just had to take a look at getting her onto the show because I really wanted to see uh basically how she got these amazing shots that I saw her posting. So I'd like to extend a welcome to Carol Ecker this evening. Hello, Hi. Carol. Hi. Good to see you. Good to see you, Carol, too. We'll come back to you later. Hey, Carol. Hi. Welcome. <laughs> Great you. to have you. Thank you. All right. So, Great to be here. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. Welcome to the show. Um, so what's interesting is that I've you've been posting a ton of stuff on our Facebook group. And I, I see your pictures all the time and you post all kinds of great stuff. And I'm used to seeing sort of a, a specific type of stuff from you. Specifically, like I'm used to seeing maybe, let's see, I got to get this. There we go. Maybe this kind of a thing. Yes. That's I know you do a ton my wildlife. of, yeah. yeah. And you've got a bunch of great wildlife photography that we see. Um, whether it's stuff like this or this guy of this photo, this yeah. is uh, a big boy in Benzet. Benzet, yeah. stuff like this. You've got a ton of great birds in flight photos, too. Oh, thank you. <laughs> that one was magical. Me. That one was so magical to see the two of them together. <laughs> I still still excited seeing that picture. That was so neat to see. And this one's you caught him mid hoot there. That's kind of cool. Was, hoo hoot. <laughs> <laughs> or stuff like this. Right. Yeah, that was the first time I got something backlit like that. So I was super excited how good it got. Yeah, I I love the um what you've got going on in the background here. Just a little bit of like light poking through the trees there. Yeah. And that I learned at Dan's camera at your classes. Oh, that's right. You joined us on one of our uh, night sky yep. outings. Yep. Cool. And I took that at Benzet too. Oh, yeah. Some nice dark skies out there. Yeah, it was beautiful. My little jumping spider. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this would be some macro work, but this is the uh, like the macro work in the spring or the summer that we were talking about. Yes. But then <laughs> this was the one that really got me curious about what you were doing. My snowflakes. Such a cool photo and such a break from some of the other stuff that you usually post. It's not wildlife. It was just a, it seemed like a kind of a departure with you. So what got you interested in making photos like this? 
I've actually seen somebody else posting a picture of a snowflake and I've actually never seen them look like that. And it just looked like jewelry to me. So I started deciding to try to take a picture mm -hmm. of one. And when I actually saw one come in focus, I was like, so surprised. I was like, they really do look like that. <laughs> so it, it was, it was like so beautiful the first time I saw it. So then I continued and keep trying. I've been trying for like three years to try to get a good one. Oh, wow. Practice, practice, practice. <laughs> but so, so this year is the first year that you've gotten some that you were really happy with? Yes, this year was, I, I think each year I try, you know, to learn a little bit more about it. So mm -hmm. I, I, even this one, I think I should have moved up my F-stop a little bit more, but each mm. time I do it, it seems to get a little bit better. But they're they're hard to take a picture of. They really are. They melt too fast, and you know, it's like the wind blows them. Mm -hmm. So they're a challenge. So, so what does your process look like if you were trying to photograph something like this? Like, how do you go about actually doing this? Well, I use. You can use like your mitten, you can use a shirt. I use a black scarf and I just kind of like hold the black scarf out and I catch snowflakes. And then once you see some that might actually be okay, then I have my camera on a, a tripod and I focus in on them and I try to snap a picture of them. I use a little light cube and I just keep, t you know, changing the settings, trying to tweak it, trying to get it in focus. Mm -hmm. And as long as it doesn't melt, I keep snapping until I get a whole bunch of pictures. But it, it's not easy. <laughs> yeah, I imagine not. Like I imagine like if I'm in working that close with a macro lens and you say you're locked down on a tripod. So I guess you yes. don't have to worry about shutter speed too much. Right. Unless it gets windy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I try to keep the shutter low, but the aperture, mm -hmm. I, I think I need to bump it to like F16 or something. Because I mm. think I did those at f11, I like believe. It's just a little bit yeah. soft. It's still so. like that's really nice, sharp photos. It's interesting that you mentioned using the little the Litra torch is the one you've got, right? Yes, yes, I got this one. <laughs> nice. I use this one. Yeah, I use this one. <laughs> yeah, and I've it's got really one of those bright. In my camera bag is just yeah, yeah, it's super bright. Real bright, and then I kind of like so hold it next to it to get the right angle because the light will shine a certain way and you can like light up certain little crystals. Okay. Yeah. So that would be like the difference between this and this. I was looking at this photo compared to like this photo. Yes. Yes. And it looks like it's the same snowflake, but just lit a little differently as to whether you're getting. Exactly. Exactly. Interesting. Yeah. I kind of like moved the light around a little bit to see, you know, if it like would like. Where you're getting that reflection. Yep. Cool. Yeah, so I imagine you've got to, like, the scarf's got to be nice and cold to start. Otherwise, the snowflakes are going to melt as soon as they hit it, right? Yeah, so I usually keep it outside so it stays cold so they don't melt right away. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, you can use anything, really. You can use a mitten, a blackboard, you know, any mm -hmm. anything that it would just land on softly so it don't, like, melt right away. Mm-hmm. I think I like the way the, the scarf has lent a little bit of texture to your background here. I think that's yeah. a neat material. It's worked out really well here. And sometimes I'll like even bunch it up so the snowflake sticks out of it a little bit more. Oh yeah, that's a good idea. Right, like so it kind of sticks upward off like a little mountain of scarf. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and when you zoom in on these guys, the, the detail is amazing. It's almost jewel-like in, yep. in that texture. You can see all the facets of the crystals. Yeah, I never, never looked into it. I mean, you used to just see white globs. I never realized how pretty they were. So what was that like for you? Like the first time that you're looking through the viewfinder and you see what they actually look like up close like this? It was a big surprise. <laughs> oh, really? I was like, wow, that's beautiful. I, I, mm -hmm. I seen, like I said, I seen somebody else taking pictures. I'm like, they don't look like that. <laughs> <laughs> And then, and then when I took them, I'm like, oh my goodness, there are a couple that look like that. <laughs> <laughs> they really do look like that. They really do. <laughs> yeah. I like this one a lot too. That one reminds me of like sugar. It was like, it's so crystally and crunchy. And crunchy kind of. each one, yeah. it's crunchy. <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah. when it's melting, when it's first, when it first lands, it's 
more fluffy and then it starts to melt and it actually makes a, even a different picture. Oh, that's interesting. Cause, Cause then you'll get like almost a clear snowflake. It turns to like a glassy type of look. Huh. So you get, you get different textures as it's melting. I would never have thought of that. That's interesting. That's really cool. Huh. Now, what kind of a lens are you using for this type of thing? And what kind of a camera setup have you got going on? I have the Nikon D500 and I have okay. the, the Tamron 90 millimeter 2.8. Oh yeah. Love that lens. Yeah. I guess the yeah. D500 makes sense for somebody doing as much wildlife photography as you do, huh? Yes. <laughs> and it was highly, it was highly recommended by Dan's. <laughs> <laughs> Now I've got the, uh, if you see like the, the bald eagle on the, the wall behind me here, that would be the, the D500 and one of the nice Tamron lenses. Excellent, excellent stuff. So what advice would you give to somebody who wants to try this out? What are some of the pitfalls that you ran into? Well, I like, guess it all said, depends. Like, learning more and more. Yeah, I, it depends on the temperature, what the temperature is outside. You kind of, like while there's a snowstorm, you have to keep going out and checking because when it first falls, sometimes it could just be like white clumps, but then maybe like 15, 20 minutes later, it could look like a snowflake. It's like as the, the, the temperature varies, it actually- oh, okay. Like the flakes that are coming down change. Yeah, I, they like change. It's a heavy wet yeah. snow, so sometimes yeah. it's a light powdery snow. So you want, which ones are the yeah. ones that give you the best shots? Like what kind of conditions are you looking for out there? I think it's more of the light snow because like when it's the real heavy, thick stuff, it didn't seem like they would turn into snowflakes. They were mm. like clumps. So they're all so just kind of like, clumped together. It kind of clumps together, but the, the light little snow seems to be the prettiest snowflakes. So but the tiny it takes, photograph better. Yeah, it takes a little mm. practice because it took me three years till I finally got some. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's definitely paid off. You've got some fantastic shots here. Oh, thank you. Oh, hey, you've got a fan in the chat. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us this evening. If somebody wants to find out a little more about your photography or see some more of their pictures, where can they go and find you? Um, on Facebook, you can look up Carol Ecker and go to you know Facebook and just add me. I'll gladly accept your friend request. Or you could just thanks. browse through all my pictures. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thanks so much for joining us this evening. This has been a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun. Thank you so much for inviting me. You're quite welcome. <laughs> it's the pleasure is entirely ours, I assure you. Oh, well, I had fun. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Have a good one. Bye -bye. You too. Bye bye. <laughs> all right. So up next, we've got another friend of ours, Joan Zachary. Joan, how are you doing this evening? I'm okay. I'm all right. Good. <laughs> so, the pictures were incredible. Right? I, I tried to do snowflakes myself when it was snowing last time and I couldn't get it at all. So I'm, I'm boy, I'm, I'm really impressed. I'm excited. <laughs> well, that was, you got some good tips. You can go out and try to, I think we're supposed I to get some snowy I'm definitely going to go out and try stuff. it again because it is almost certainly going to snow again, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so all of Carol's stuff is outdoorsy. She's out there doing the wildlife and she's out there taking pictures of the snowflakes. But what I thought was interesting about your stuff was maybe for some of us that aren't <laughs> as likely to venture out into the snowstorm, you had some really interesting stuff <laughs> that was, let's say unique. I don't think I've really seen a whole lot of people I'm not Taking the only pictures. one who does this, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> exactly like, well, that's, there's such a creativity and playfulness in these pictures and I can't wait to share them with people. So let's take a look. <laughs> let's take a look. Let me see what you have. <laughs> All right. So I've got one of my favorites, this guy. Uh, weed whacker guy. <laughs> weed whacker guy. <laughs> Weed whacker guy, and in fact, I have him right here, so you can see how. Come over here, see how tiny he is. Here he is. See how tiny <laughs> he 
Yes, he's not a very big guy at all. So, um, but he will do your whole lawn in you know no time flat. <laughs> um, and actually, and that's, a, that's a tray of um, cress sprouts. We we were doing some sprouts as a culinary experiment, and I put him in there, and he looks like he's very hard at work. Uh, it sits next to a big window in my house, so that's all natural light that he's got there. So. Oh, okay. So you've just got window light coming in, and just window light. Yeah, yeah. I'm a big fan of available light. Uh, mm -hmm. Whatever's around, if you can make it work, then then by all means, go ahead and and do that. Um, and and I think paying attention to available light in your home will really teach you about, you know, what you can do. There's all kind of cool things you can do with light as the day goes on. And it's really, I, I think it's an important thing to try to learn that, you know, hey, we're all home all the time now anyway. So, you know, why not? Mm -hmm. Right. So you kind of figure out like, okay, this time of the day, the sunlight is coming through this window in yeah. this direction. Yes. Yes. It reflects that's, that's off of this window. wall and fills back in this way. Yep, yep, that's a western window you're looking at. So that was in the afternoon. Nice. I guess the first time I think I saw any of these photos was this one. <laughs> that was on a dance photo shoot, by the way. Right. That was I think that's the first time I met you. Oh, okay. Okay. And we were at uh the Johnston Mansion. Mm-hmm. Photographing that old abandoned building. Yeah, it was the hottest I was walking around. Hottest day of the year. It was the hottest. Oh man, it was sweltering in there. <laughs> and I'm walking around and I'm checking in on people, and then I see somebody placing little plastic figures. <laughs> <laughs> I do that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is happening in here? <laughs> Well, you know, they, they, they come, they go with me all over the place. That guy, is, I think, is in his box right now. But he's about, he's about five inches tall. And, and that was the one of the bathrooms at that, at the mansion. And, the Johnson uh, Mansion. Yeah. And, and I titled that one, um, Your Conscience is Waiting to Speak to You. you know, <laughs> we've all had those moments where we, you know, saw ourselves in the mirror and then conscience was sitting there. Mm-hmm. That's what I really enjoy about a lot of these pictures. They almost have, they've got some kind of a narrative, almost a cinematic quality to them. Well, you know, I was a writer before I was a photographer. And I think okay. this is part of, part of what I, where that all comes from. I, I, you know, I have to have characters and, and I have to have a story. And so I guess that's mm -hmm. where all this comes from. So speaking of characters, where do you acquire... <laughs> All these characters. <laughs> um, you, you know, I, I keep my eyes open. I go to a lot of flea markets. I go a lot. Go to a lot of yard sales, and and a lot. Of, that's where a lot of them come from. But they come from all kinds of places. Um, um, Weed Whacker guy came from Tractor Supply, and <laughs> and he came with a. He also a, a, while I was there, I also found him a little John Deere tractor. So we have some pictures with him and his tractor. Um, some uh, sometimes people give them to me. I have a friend who gave me uh, a couple of plumbers. Oh. We have any plumbers in in Plasticville if we didn't have my friend Rhonda? So yeah, so they come every come from all over the place, and I'm actually very proud of this picture because just recently I finally decided to bite the bullet and get organized, so you can see the big labels there, and and I know what's in what boxes, and those are all, you know. Good to know where things are they, because they, these do go on walkabout. They do go on walkabout. I'll, they, I'll go <laughs> one of them and I'll go. I can't find them anywhere, and and you know, so they they take walks and then they come back magically. It's amazing. Okay. So this is like other people see your pictures and then think, oh, she needs this guy. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes you 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 know they they're helping me populate. So. <laughs> So, ah, <laughs> tell me a story of how you come up with a picture idea for something like this. Oh my gosh. Um, well, and I can't, ah, what did I do with it? I can't find the little jar now. Those figures are about, well, the, the canoe is about an inch long. 
and the paper, tiny, tiny. yeah, and the paper that's under it came from the craft store, the scrapbooking part department at the craft store, and it's kind of it. It I just started playing with the paper and started kind of pinching it and rolling it and 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 looking at it in the light. This is mm -hmm. some available light so um you know this was a uh, up here in my studio light was off kind of to the right and i just started pinching and playing with it and looking at it through the viewfinder of the camera and taking okay. test shots and i started looking at it thinking you know what this looks like water and so i dug up the little the little guys in their canoe and and put them in there and took an awful lot of test shots to make to see if i could make it work and there we are and this is the real life view so you can see how small that really is it's just a little tiny thing on a sheet of this pliable it's kind of like the stuff they wrap candy in oh okay yeah, yeah just kind of foil and it's kind of a foil yeah it's kind of a, a paperback foil so I try lots of different types of paper. Um, I look for things that um, reflect light. Um, so I go into the, the crafting department. I go into the scrapbooking department and look for stuff. Some stuff mm -hmm. works better than others. One word of warning, if you want to try this, don't buy paper that has glitter on it. <laughs> and glitter on your fingers, put it back because that could get it camera and that would be a tragedy so you know yeah, glitter gets everywhere glitter is a bad thing glitter is yeah. a bad thing so some of your pictures look like they're little set pieces in their little world and then some of your pictures are they kind of <laughs> exist in our world <laughs> Sometimes they are. And um, the ones that are more in their world, I use a, my, I, I'm a mirrorless shooter. I shoot Olympus. And mm -hmm. I use, for the ones where I'm in their world, I use my 60 millimeter macro lens, um, which I love that lens, by the way. Oh, yeah. The this, one is is with, this one is with my 14 to 150 zoom, my kind of everyday little black dress. Swiss Army knife lens, and sometimes when I'm cooking, I just think that the little people should be a part of the part of the <laughs> So we were making something with potatoes, and <laughs> and that was with the 15 to 140. And this one is one of my very favorite. I love this. It's got it's just such a like quiet, poetic kind of moment here. Yeah, and it was just one of these things that fell together. Um, that was in the same room where Mr. Where you saw Mr. Uh, Weedwacker earlier. Um, and over the summer, we got some big bookcases in that room, and we had a lot of old books around that we kind of wanted to get out. They had some sentimental meaning. Those books that you see there all belong to my dad. Oh, and wow. yeah, and so we had we we put them put them in this big bookcase, and I was sitting in that room one day just minding my own business, and I thought, you know, I had to try some some pictures in here. The lights are really good, so I went and I got these two and set them up in a place where the you know where you can see the books are leaning, and tried a couple of different things, and this is what we ended up with. So, you know, not all of these are are humorous or whimsical. Some of them are kind of personal so like this one. I really like this one. Thank you. And then they seem to sort of kind of either <laughs> interact with their environment or <laughs> I got one like the guy on the lower right, are you building him little costumes? Like what's yeah, going on? Here? I, feel, I sometimes <laughs> build little costumes. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's a uh, for those of you who don't know, that's a cupcake wrapper that he's wearing as a kilt. Um, <laughs> um so yeah, sometimes I, I will look for little costumes, sometimes I will just look for ways for them to interact with their environment. Um sometimes I look for reflective stuff that will create some light. For example, mm -hmm. the guy in the upper right corner is actually, he looks like he's in some tropical paradise. He's yeah. actually sitting in the doorway to my washing machine. I have one of those <laughs> little washing machines and it's all metal inside, right? And put some lights inside, put some feathers in there to kind of hide the lights and make it look more tropical and went from there. So there so he is. 
inside the washing machine. Just inside the door of the washing machine. <laughs> Yeah, you can kind of see in the lower right corner there, he's kind of leaning on there. Yeah, a little bit of a... Yeah. <laughs> ah. What the heck is going on here? Oh, I was playing with the There's little... smoke. I was playing with smoke, and I had some incense sticks. And put that oh, on the okay. and aim the light. That's kind of a blue piece of construction paper or something in the back there. I think mm -hmm. I... And I sat them down, and then I hid the um, hid the incense stick below them so it wasn't in in the frame, and just took a whole bunch. And this one was the one where I liked the smoke the best. That's an interesting. So there's the smoke, and then there's the light, and there's the background, and there's this whole little setup to get this working. Whole little, whole little yeah, whole little world. <laughs> a tiny, tiny little portrait studio. <laughs> tiny, tiny, yes. <laughs> ah, now this was at the State Theater in Easton, and um, Frank Smith, yeah. you know, yep, um, has been has sponsored every year except last year. Sai, um, he sponsors a photo shoot at the State Theater, and I've gone I've gone about three or four times now. Um, the first time I didn't didn't bring him along, and I was really sorry I didn't. So every year since then, I've brought a bag of little people, and while they're up on the stage doing wide-angle lens and other things that, that Frank likes to do, I sneak off to the dressing rooms and up in the balcony, and, and we, we have a little fun. So, you know. I love the, like everything about this shot, the shot, the pose yeah. and the lighting and like... <laughs> The little people, it's so cool because they can buy one seat and they can all fit in it. It's great. <laughs> so I guess like what would your tips be for if somebody wants to go and try this out for themselves? Like where are you looking for, do you go to like model train shops or? <laughs> model train shops are a good place. Um, flea markets are a good place. Um, especially locally, there seem to be a lot of the flea markets, there seem to be a lot of people who sell um, model train stuff. And I end up getting, mm, yeah. Uh, yeah, not only little people, but I also end up getting buildings. This is my little motel motel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, it, it, but the cool thing about this is it's got an empty bottom. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll stick a light, like the cube light that Carol was showing earlier. I've got one of those too. I'll mm -hmm. stick those inside and then it lights up the windows and it, it looks really, it looks really cool. Oh, nice. I looked for an example for you and I couldn't find it. I think I lost <laughs> it in the hard drive crash of 2015, but I'll um, Make some more so but yeah um gosh keep your eyes open you know you're you're gonna find dollar stores you're you're gonna find all kinds of things and you know it also teaches you a different way of looking at the world um there's a guy look up a guy on facebook called he has a website called miniature calendar and he does a lot of stuff hmm. like this he will take everyday items and little tiny plastic people and put them around them. And you go, oh, my gosh, I never thought of that. The other day he had one where, you know, the little um, round boxes that you put contact lenses in. He mm -hmm. had his little people using them as motorcycles. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you have to look at things and just kind of use your imagination. Really, you look at things and you go, gosh, what could this be? If I was a little tiny one inch person, what would I think this was? Um, you know, and, and, and really it's the spirit of play. You know, it's a, it's a perfectly acceptable grown up play because, hey, I got an expensive camera over here. I'm, you know, I'm not just. <laughs> right, I like, this is serious <laughs> business. <laughs> I got a couple of expensive cameras that I bought at dance. Like, so. <laughs> so, you know, so use your imagination. Don't be afraid like to a, take lots of test shots. Don't mm -hmm. be afraid to use available light. I do use um, regular lights too, although I wish I knew more about that. And and so I'm that's one skill that I that I really want to develop. Um, but I have a couple little LED lights, and I also go down and buy those little flashlights that you can buy, like at um, here we go. You can buy these things at like Harbor Freight. 
and mm, yeah. it, you can put them off to the side or put them, you know, inside your no-till motel or whatever and get some pretty good light that way too. This is just an LED light. And okay, it's just, so just like you can get red or you can get white and it, it blinks. <laughs> so you can do a lot of different things and really just play around. I, I started doing this as a way to learn how to use a macro lens. I started out doing this on my Nikon D5100. Mm -hmm. And then when I went mirrorless, it was go for it. You know, it was, it really got even, even better and even easier. So, yeah. And it seems like this is an ideal bad weather winter kind of project oh, because it you know. really has been it really has been it was funny because at the beginning of the pandemic it was kind of a little freaky and i kind of set the little people aside for a little while because i thought oh this is a really heavy time and nobody's really going to want to see some little two inch people running around and 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 all that and then about six weeks later i was really bored and i said i got to get them out again so we got back together and it's been it's been fun ever since. <laughs> Rainbows and unicorns all the time. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So if people want to see more of your work, where can they go and find you and see more of these oh, pictures? Well, thanks to being invited to be on the photo show tonight. Um, that was an inspiration for me to finally get my act together and put my blog up. So my blog is joanzachary.zenfolio.com. And Excellent. all right, yeah, we will definitely Zachary. put that in the notes. Yeah, joanzachary.zenfolio.com. And also um, I have a Flickr page um, if you're on Flickr. So look for Joan Zachary, all one word. And there's an album of little people pictures on there. I take lots of other kinds of pictures too, but you're going to love the little people. And <laughs> there's cat pictures, there's other kinds of pictures, but I, but we've got, we got lots of little people for you. Cool. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us this evening. This has been a lot of fun. Pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Night. <laughs> All right. So let's head on back to Dan's Camera City and check in with Phil. We're going to take a look at a little video that he put together with some of his recent macro adventures. <laughs> Scott, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. So, uh, boy, thank you. First, first of all, thank you, ladies. That was fantastic. Uh, fantastic people. Every time I meet them, they always inspire me. So thanks for being along for the ride tonight. That was just great. Appreciate Absolutely. It. So what the heck were we just looking at? I'm going to... What, what were we just looking at? Well, <laughs> the uh, interesting thing is you said earlier about... When, uh, Anytime when you can't really get out and do kind of things that some people like to do, like the landscape, or wildlife, all that kind of stuff. But I have a love for macro, whatever it is. Any kind, you can find something. You're, uh, you're breaking up. up a little bit on us there. Is it any better now? Is that any good? I think so. No good. The video's a little choppy. All right. Yeah. Let's give it a go. Let me know all if right. it's uh, up for you. But anyway, uh, macro, you can always find something close up. Uh, or macro to shoot. So sometimes when we can't get outside, we try things indoors. And this was an example of something uh, that I've been experimenting with for a while. And a lot of people have done this kind of thing, not always with video, more like with stills, but this is actually a soap bubble, believe it or not. And we'll explain a little bit about the techniques and how you get that. And we'll also take a look at some still images on how you can get some really wild colors and that kind of thing. So we'll come back to the video uh, a little in a, in a little bit, but just to touch on it, what you're seeing there really is using a digital SLR camera with a with a macro close-up lens attached, and also a close-up filter to get it even closer to the scene. So 
when you have that in a in a, in an area where everything's black, you're inside of a uh, what we call a light tent um, or a, or a close up tent. Everything's everything's dark except the light that's coming from above. And actually, this one wasn't a tent so much; it was a soft box coming from above. So if you just have that light coming down and everything else is dark, what you tend to see is just the color in the uh, the kind of the rainbow in the in the bubbles, which is fun stuff. Neat. All right, so let's take a look at some pictures here. Tell us about what is going on. So here's another one that happens to be something that you can do indoors, uh, playing around with soap bubbles. And you've got, oh gosh, about a eight inch spike there that's coming down on that soap bubble. That soap bubble is probably about three or three inches or so in diameter. And this was actually just capturing it right at the moment when it was falling onto the spike. So it's kind of tricky to do this kind of stuff with, uh, without practicing and without a little bit of experimentation. And what you're actually seeing here is another digital SLR shot with a macro lens and a close-up filter to make it really extreme close-up. And then this is one where we actually did this inside one of our light tents. So these light okay. tents, sometimes they have lights on the outside. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Sometimes they have lights on the outside. This one has all the lights on the inside and there's some diffusion material on the top of it that kind of softens things. So what's interesting about this one is those light tents, a lot of people use for photographing their collectibles, stamps, coins, all kinds of collectibles, mm -hmm. or things to sell on auction sites on eBay and that kind of thing. You can use them for a variety of things. Interesting tip is uh, the ones that we have and several of these have a hole in the top of the tent. And mm -hmm. that is designed for you to shoot down into. If you have a very large flat area or a flat item, it's designed to shoot your camera down into it to see that thing. Well, I thought, why not put the spike inside and drop some bubbles from down below and see if we can get a shot like this. And that's what we got. Right. So you get the hole in the top that you're dropping stuff down through. Yep. Look yeah. like a little crazy person blowing bubbles and, you know, into a light tent, but <laughs> You practice, you get a shot like this. So just real quickly, something like this was using also a flash, an external flash. Okay. That was set to real high, to, and we did this in a very high speed. This is about um, 1 3200th of a second. So some cameras will allow you to do the very fast sh uh, shutter speeds like that with flash. Mm -hmm. Yep. Cool. Okay. So, here, so here's, Yeah. So here's, here's an example of something similar to what you saw in the video, except we're just capturing none of the dark area beneath. We're just capturing the dome of color mm -hmm. on the top of a bubble. Yeah. Right. So, and then that's, this was not the light tent, right? This was your little setup like this? Correct. Correct. It's not a light tent, but that is a setup where we're using a soft box. And I'll show you one in a moment. A lot of people have soft boxes that they use for, people in portrait work and sometimes for product photography. And um, I have that set up when you're looking at this picture, that little dish you see there is maybe about two and a half inches in diameter. And that's where the soap solution is. And with a straw, you're just kind of reaching into the, the area oh, okay. and where the, that is and you're blowing the bubble while it sits there. Gotcha. I was going to, I didn't know if like you had like blow a bubble and try to land it on that thing. Oh or no. Your, no, that would, that would be even crazier. No, <laughs> actually, you can slide it out a little bit, <laughs> and you're really just getting a half a bubble, like on uh -huh. the dome on the top of this thing. But you'll notice that everything around it is black. Yeah. Right? Or dark. These yeah. things are actually black with the light that kind of come out gray. That's critical, because in this shot, the background is entirely black. But even more importantly, in the other, in the video, the almost looks like a donut hole that donut dark part that's actually bubble that you're not seeing any color on so it's kind of crazy and then here's a still shot without being cropped so okay, it kind of so looks like it's floating part. in space yeah and if you look real close you'll see the dish right below it that little light gray area okay below. yeah that's the, that's right the dish. yeah so since all this light's coming down from the top you're not seeing, it almost looks like there's nothing there uh, on the bottom part of the bubble. And then uh, we're just cropping that out to get the best part of the image. So one tip here for anybody who's been doing this or trying it, if you are using a soft box and you're doing what I did, which I, I had four canisters kind of holding up the soft box, and I'll show you in a second. And uh, I found out rather quickly any reflections are gonna mess up. So I have some felt around those canisters. 
Gotcha. And I'm going to show you the ideal way to do this. I mean, by the way, if you don't happen to have a softbox, any of you who happen to have one of these uh, five-in-one reflectors. Oh, yeah. The Venable yeah, five-in-one. various sizes. I know you guys talk about this all the time, and they're, they're useful for so many things. I use these a lot for macro shots. But the diffusion part that's inside of this, whatever light source you have, you can certainly try this by putting this in between your light source and all the dark area that you've kind of set up around this. Now, what you would want to do is you'd want to get some kind of black material and temporarily tape it around so you only have one little open area where you've got your tray. Okay, so you're going to make a little okay? like a curtain around it that kind yeah, of blocks Yeah, you're going to make a little curtain stuff. around it. Yeah, exactly. You're just going to have everything dark, have it on a table. And I'll show you the ideal way where if you look at a lot of these bubble images online, you'll see that that bottom part is nice and smooth and it comes around nice and smooth. Well, those canisters were some of what were messing that up a little bit. So a lot of people who might have uh, other uh, lighting supplies for um, portraits and that kind of thing might have something like this, which is a boom arm. Sorry, I'm out of frame for a second. We'll see if I can get this in sight for you. Gotcha. Okay, yeah. So this is the light box, you know, that we used. And if you can imagine, that tray needs to be about four to six inches below this. All right, it can't be right up against, but about four to six inches below. But what's nice about this is I can just tape a black cloth of any kind around here, get this all set up on a table. And then if I need to, this allows me to move it very nice exactly where I want to. Yeah. So something like this is really handy to have. It's got a lot of multiple purposes other than for just doing people portrait stuff. But this is what we're talking about when we're talking about a softbox. And right. uh, as I said, if you don't happen to have that, but you have one of these or you want to grab one of these guys, I would get one that's a little bit bigger perhaps. And this mm -hmm. is real handy and that'll soften that light. So. Yeah, I know those are fantastic for macro. Sometimes I'm, when I've shot stuff like I'm in the backyard and I'm trying to take a picture of a bug and I've got the I've just propped the five in one on my head and made myself a little tent there. But yep, if you don't have somebody yeah. to hold it, that's what you tend to do. You put them on your head and you kind of make do with what you have. Exactly. <laughs> yep. And then so what were you doing to get the, the swirly action in the exactly. video? The uh, what what you would find is when uh, and you'll find this very quickly is when you first blow the bubble and it's kind of sitting there it's not looking very exciting and then sometimes you get kind of a horizontal band of color and say like, oh this is kind of interesting but then it doesn't really do a whole lot sometimes um, mm -hmm. so with the same straw that you would be blowing the bubble with um, from a distance even you can kind of agitate that bubble a little bit and just a little bit of breath on that will kind of get all of that going so as a bubble uh matures if we want to call it that way as it gets closer to popping its colors actually start to get better and then you'll know when it's going to pop because the colors start to diminish then so you kind of get a feel for this after you try it a few times but when you see the st colors start to come into play that's when you want to start shooting and if they aren't swirling whether you're doing video or whether you're doing the stills you just want to blow on it a little bit from a distance out of frame and you're mm -hmm. going to get a whole lot of colors going on there if you see that the top bubble is just white uh -huh. That means that it may be too close to your light source. So just move it away a little bit, swirl okay. it around with some on the straw, and you're going to get some cool colors. Have some fun. Interesting. That's way more about bubbles than I ever knew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the last tip is uh, the last tip as far as just a just a, a real quick thing, and a lot of people know this who've tried it, but if you haven't, bubbles don't last very long from the things that you buy in the store. So these are things that you can create yourself. Um, this is a mix of warm water, um, dish soap, liquid dish soap, and the important key ingredient to give it some longevity is glycerin. A little vial of glycerin, a couple of tablespoons of that, and that you can find at craft stores and sometimes at mm -hmm. drug stores and that kind of thing. Yep, and that's what keeps them keeps them going longer. Cool. Well we'll post the uh, we'll post the soap bubble recipe in the comments. There we go. All right, so I guess while we're talking about light tents, then we kind of move on to stuff like this and this. I guess this is sort of the more typical use for that light tent that you were talking about. Uh, I'm not seeing the picture there. Let's see what we got. Oh. Something I got that thing. 
I got to hit the correct button. There we go. There we go. <laughs> yeah. So this is a real example of shooting down into a light tent and that hole from the top that I was talking about. The hole is maybe about three, four inches in diameter. Mm -hmm. And the lights are coming from the top. So there's a little hole in the diffusion that you kind of peel back just for when you're shooting. And this is, a, this is a porcelain plate. And if you saw it up close or if it's showing pretty big on your screen, you really couldn't tell that this was a fairly reflective object. A uh, little bit of arc of light in some of the highlights and some of the arcs mm -hmm. there. But other yeah, than that, just the little. light tent does a beautiful job of lighting it without giving you a lot of really crude um, reflections on it. Nice. Here's another example of shooting down into the light tent using that same device uh, for a more uh, uh, a more classic purpose, shall we say. And this is just a vintage camera pointing mm -hmm. upwards to the top of the light tent. Simple stuff. Yeah. That's a, those light tents are great for, like, you just need to throw together a quick picture. But I guess I hadn't thought of it in, in terms of, like, a more complicated studio setup for your bubbles and stuff. Yeah. As my wife would say, I tend to get complicated and work back to reality. You find a fun photo project problem and then you solve it. It's kind of fun. <laughs> so here's an example of something you could do in a light tent. You can certainly do this. And I've done lots of jewelry shots like this one in a light tent. This was done a little bit differently with two soft boxes. And we're using white plexiglass as the base, which kind of gives you some nice white light bouncing off of the, uh, the lights that are coming down into it. And then, of course, taking it into Photoshop, tidying it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll look at the jewelry shots I think you have there. Here's another one. Uh, styling is always fun rather than just laying something out straight. The tip I like to give folks for this is have a couple of paintbrushes around, not with any paint on them, nice and clean. And either with the hard end of it or even the soft end of it, depending on how hard the bristles are, you can kind of move things around. Nudge softly those little pieces. On them. What's that? So you just kind of like you can nudge the individual little pieces to get yeah. them exactly where you want. It's a little easier to get a curve with something like that than trying to do it with your fingers. Obviously, tweezers will help, but mm -hmm. like a fan tip paintbrush is nice to have because it keeps dust off the area too. If you get oh, dust on it. So, yeah. Uh, one of those real soft fan tip paintbrushes. Anytime you got some dust falling down, whisk it off. Remember, you're not going to see until you really look at it in the computer just how much dust shows up on these things. So, oh, you yeah. to keep it as clean as possible, style it up, and have a ball. Yeah. Uh, same situation, we're using two uh, soft boxes at just about 45 degree angles uh, with white all around it. This is kind of instead of the black all around it like we had for the for the other stuff we were doing, mm -hmm. this would be with white around it so that there's no harsh uh, shadows of anything dark that might be in your room. And nope. often you want to turn right. the lights off in the room so that you're not getting anything, any kind of glare. So turn the lights off in the room, just use the light sources that you have and try to have only white light bouncing off jewelry and that kind of stuff. It's going to help a whole lot. Right, because you're taking a picture. I mean, it's like taking a picture of a little mirror, right? Like anything that's in there, you're going to see it show up in those reflections. Yeah, and getting back to the light tents for, for just a quick moment, uh, the ones we have here, you've got a flap that comes from the top and the bottom, the part that you shoot through on the front. Those flaps, a lot of people don't close those except for letting a little opening for your camera. Well. If you don't do that, anything that's behind you, anything dark, which is going to be most of the things behind you compared to the light in the tent, is going to show up in a reflective object, whether it's porcelain or glass or jewelry. So you want to use the close off just the area, except for the area that your camera is, 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 is using for the tent. And that way mm -hmm. you're going to get some uh, reflection. We get a lot of questions about reflective uh, jewelry. So there you go. Nice. Another perfect rainy day kind of project. You don't have to exactly. venture out. Indoors? Yep. Yeah. Fun All right. So how about if we are going to venture outdoors? You've got a whole bunch of other great stuff here. Yeah, we'll go through these some of these quickly. Here's a good example of how important it is to kind of get up early before the sun starts shining and starts to uh, melt the, uh, the ice crystals that are out there. And this was kind of an unusual find. You don't always see stuff like this exactly this way, kind of ready to be photographed. So this is just a, a, a grass stalk, a dried out grass stalk. And it's got some really interesting three dimensions coming from all dimension, I, dimensions, ice uh, directions, ice crystals on it. Mm -hmm. And it just screamed at me. And I was like, boy, I got to shoot this. And it took a little while to find the composition. 
So we kind of have the some diagonals going from bottom right to upper left. And then in the background, uh, I did need to use a wide depth of field to get. And by that, I mean a, a higher f-stop number. This was up around uh, f11 or f16 so that I can get all the ice crystals in focus. Mm. But then the background, if it had to be seen because of that, I figured I might as well use the diagonal lines behind it. So right. that was a problem. Nice. Yep. Kind of so what kind of a, is this a, is this a macro shot to get in on those ice crystals? It, it, it is. This is a uh, digital SLR with um, a macro lens, a 60 millimeter macro lens. And I think one small like, extension tube, extension tubes ah, okay. like that close up filter that I talked about. These are the extension tubes. Um, these come in sets of three. You can put one on, in which case I was just using one thin one here to give me just a little bit closer with that macro lens. And uh, you can stack it together if you want to get crazy close. But uh, so this was a macro lens and a polarizing filter to deal with some of the reflections. Uh, so you want a polarizing filter for a lot of this close up stuff, whether it's indoor or out, because that cuts down on a lot of the glare. All right. That makes yep. sense. Yeah. And the extension tubes just push it out further to give you even more yeah, magnification, the cool, right? Yeah, the cool thing about extension tubes and the close-up filters is you don't necessarily have to have a macro lens to get closer to things. A lot of mm -hmm. people don't realize that. So you've got um, a couple of different types of close-up filters. Some of them come in sets of three. Some of them are, they just come one at a time, but they're much higher quality, like the ones that I was using for uh, some of the bubble stuff called chromatic. Uh, Close-up filter, a funny term for just really high quality, less distortions. Uh, a lot of good, a lot of good quality images come out of that. So you can use that on the kit lens that came with your camera, for instance. You know, if you don't have right. a digital SLR yeah. or a mirrorless camera that has the interchangeable lenses, most of the point-and-shoot cameras, from the very small ones to the more advanced, they do macro fantastically. So just keep that in mind. That achromatic close-up filter. That's uh, that's pretty new, right? Like I think we only recently got that in. Yeah, they're, they're fairly new and they're thicker. These are a little thicker than your typical close-up filter, which are usually the size almost of just like a protection filter. Uh -huh. So it's a little thicker this way, but there's a dual element in there. And the reason it's a little bit bigger and a little bit heavier is it's just higher quality. They're mm -hmm. able to reduce a lot of the distortions with these by making them that way. So Yeah, that's what I was going to say is that to look at those bubble pictures that you had, I would not have guessed that you were using a close-up filter because I've used close-up filters yeah. before. And there's always, there may be a little soft or there's a little distortion around the edge or there might be some color fringing. And it's okay for, you know, for what they are. But Yeah, the lesser expensive filters are a lot of fun. The sweet spot right in the middle is where it's best. You get some softness around the edges. But for that reason, a lot of people shy away from them if they haven't tried them. A lot of people try and say, I don't know what they're talking about. This is fine for me. Yeah, uh, but then you have these, which are just kind of that next level and a lot of fun for uh, whether it's a kit lens or whether it is your macro lens that you just want to get crazy and close with. Yeah. So yep. what else have we got here? So here's here's using a macro lens that's not an extreme close up, but mm -hmm. when you're outdoors and you're looking for things, the kind of things you want to look for is is contrast, of course. Uh, in this area here, there's not a whole lot of contrast except for this uh, grass. There's dried grass that's coming up. So mm -hmm. just find yourself in this composition. Here we're using the rule of thirds a little bit. The base of that grass we're having right about at the bottom third level of the uh, of the picture. And you'll notice the little sprig off to the right kind of adds some balance. So have some fun. It's not always about extreme close-ups. Sometimes you're dialing back a little bit, but you're still using a macro lens. And I love what you're doing here with shape and texture and making that the real subject of the picture is all about light and dark and textures and lines yeah and you really you really have to keep your eyes peeled because what you're seeing here is actually the water of a stream below this shelf of ice and uh it's i'm at the edge of the stream so i'm pretty close to where this is i'm a, you know a few feet away but the the drop that you're seeing isn't actually dripping it's actually frozen and it just happened to be that yeah. one single drip coming from that shelf and it Took a little while to get the the shot set up but the the payoff was there it's kind of a nice fun thing to play on dark and light here's a good example of using other filters other than the close-up filters uh what you're seeing there is uh we're framing some some ice is framing some little rivulet in a stream there so we're using a close-up we're using a uh, a macro lens 
uh, an extension tube to get really close. But, but then we're also using uh, a polarizer and an ND filter. The, the polarizer helps with the glare, but the ND filter, all that's doing is helping you slow down the shutter speed. So you right, have so that you smooth that flow. Of the moving water. Yeah, I was thinking like about, what you would use for fall. Yeah. I was thinking about that today. Normally, I like ask anybody at the store when I it's lunch hour and I go for a walk and I usually grab my camera and have my camera with me. And this is exactly the kind of thing that I was looking at today. Like things are starting to melt. And there was a lot of like, as you're walking around, there's ice and there's moving water underneath it. And there was this neat interaction between those elements. Yeah. The, think transition. You know, the, the word transition to me is the kind of thing I, I when you when I hear you talking about that, that you look for. So as we come in either from a colder day to a warmer day or vice versa, or as we come from winter to spring, Sometimes it's a little messy and sloshy outside and whatever, but sometimes you find some really cool stuff because you have transitory things like this that uh, that you can find if you really keep your eyes open. Speaking of which. Uh, speaking of texture, yeah, we're going after some texture here. And uh, also a transition. This would have been uh, in the springtime where the snow is starting to melt back. And although it's not quite alive just yet, the grass you're seeing what, what almost looks like the grass kind of emerging from winter just and play around, yeah, play around with the composition. And this would have been a macro a 60 millimeter macro lens and, uh, and one extension tube to get, to get in even closer. And believe it or not, is this? as you come into, believe it or not, as you come into the latter part of winter, this was in the, this was, I think the second day in April believe it or not. If we had had a snow and there were some spider, little spiders crawling around and there was this fly, this is an extreme close up. And the kind of tool you need for something like this is um, either a flash that you're holding off to the side or what we call a ring light flash. And that's something that kind of fits around your lens. But mm -hmm. when you get an extreme close like this, this is a combination of uh, those close up, those uh, extension tubes I talked about several of those on a macro lens to get extremely close. This is hardly cropped at all. This is almost the very full image. But the ring light that works for the, uh, that goes around your lens, as you get closer to things, you tend to block the light away. And I know you know that, Scott, right? When you're yeah. close, you tend yeah, to like start your own light. Extreme close, you start blocking it. It's like the light's not there. So you need something to kind of illuminate it. And because these ring flashes, most of them have a diffuser or a softener on them, you're not getting any kind of harsh uh, light. It's not like a deer in the headlights kind of splash of light for it. So um, we carry a Godox uh, ring flash that's kind of useful. It's kind of fun for that kind of stuff. Interesting. I've yeah. never actually played with like the super up close ring light stuff. And yeah, it is, and, and, it can be kind of a struggle if it's, you know, it sure you're is. kind of casting your own shadow around the thing that you're trying to take a picture of. And what I haven't mentioned for uh, for any of these images so far is I think without fail, every single one was also on a tripod, including this one, including this one. Really? So you're, yeah. you're on a tripod trying to take pictures of moving bugs. Yeah. And the other people on the trail were looking at me kind of funny, but that's OK. So <laughs> here, here's a good example. This is a, this is a pretty light tripod, but the center column in this one also goes sideways. Yeah, let's get a closer so look at if that. If I had my camera on here. With the ring flash, I can get this down really low to the ground, and I don't have to be kind of tipping the ball head over, right? So this kind of thing is really handy for that kind of stuff. It lets you get very close to things, or even the indoor stuff if you want to go straight down and shoot mm -hmm. straight down. On oh, sure, for those tabletop kind of lay flat setups. Yeah, all that lay flat, whether it's food photography or whatever it is, a lot of people, a lot of the pros will have their camera, you know, fixed above them on a, a more permanent thing. But you could easily use a tripod like that with a crossbar. Yeah, so that works real well. And here's the kind of thing that you just look for texture and color. Um, you know, red goes a long way in wintertime. Uh, this is, uh, if, oh, I'm yeah. not sure how big it's showing on the screen for folks, but... These are all snowflakes on there. there we can when, see after you get done seeing the leaf itself, you'll see that there are some red needles and uh, they kind of guide you around the rest of the thing. So a little bit of red or reddish color is something to look for. Sometimes you can find those red berries in wintertime. Uh, you don't need a lot of color, but a little bit of pop of that red color really goes a long way. And this was just the leaf I found 
just as it was on a railroad tie, a little mossy railroad tie. Yeah. Kind of takes us right back around to the beginning. We can see all these little snowflakes there and all the structure yeah. of them. Not quite as, nice. as, as tight in as Carol had it, but uh, <laughs> there's a lot of them. Yeah. Probably the reason we so so many of those uh, the photos of the the cardinal and the red berries on the snowy branch. Yeah, yeah. that's why it looks so great. You know that yeah. the pop of color is fantastic. And here's just looking for texture. Um, yeah, I love a good this. Thing to, thank you. A good thing to practice is getting your lens on a shot like this as perpendicular. If we're looking down on this, this is just over a puddle. Um, as perpendicular as possible, because if you don't, when you get extremely close to anything with macro, and those of you who tried it know that if you're off by even a little bit, then one of those sides or corners is not gonna be sharp. And you'll wonder what went wrong. Your focus was there, but it just didn't work. Right. Yeah, speaking a, of that, this this is another fun thing. This this camera actually has something called a, um, a reversal ring. And this is just a kit lens on here. This is just a kit yeah, lens. Turn backwards. <laughs> Turn backwards, but there's a ring you put between the lens and the camera, and you can take your kit lens. It's going to be manual focus, mm -hmm. and you're not going to have a, your, your usual automatic readings. But the only way you're going to get it in focus is by moving it closer or further away, which is why a tripod is handy. So something like these are really inexpensive, but boy, you can have a lot of fun for not a lot of money with uh, some basic lenses. Oh, yeah, those reversal rings are yeah. way up there on the fun per dollar value scale. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, here That's... we're getting a little more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> this one's a little different. We uh, we're actually combining five shots for this. This is this would be considered an HDR or a high oh. dynamic range. Okay. You, yeah, you got to have that on a tripod for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, and the way that we're getting that smooth ribbony uh, water is we are using a very dark neutral density filter, actually a couple of them on there. So of the five exposures, the longest exposure was 25 seconds and the shortest exposure was about six seconds. So the rock isn't going anywhere. That was rock, rock solid. That's good. <laughs> that was rock <laughs> steady, as was the tripod. So that's why uh -huh. it is sharp. Once we get right. focused on that, but the water's moving around it, but it's a long shutter speed for all those shots. And then you're just blending them together and in Photoshop or Lightroom. Nice. All right, so I guess we're gonna take a look back outside while we're out here. These are all things that you've kind of found out there in nature. Exactly. But we're finally coming around to the title card of the show. <laughs> yeah, this is the one that you probably saw in the promos. And uh, this is uh, taking the bubble stuff outside and just quickly here, you do need, uh, in fact, I'm, I found this anyway. This is actually a different solution of bubbles homemade. This is the warm water and then it is um, corn syrup and sugar, really? believe it or not. All those things combined because you want it to freeze, but you have to have it be lasting. And you really should actually put it in the freezer for about 20 minutes or so before you take that solution outside. So oh. what you're looking at here, you'll see in a moment, but that top part, as you may have guessed, or some of you may have guessed, is a frozen bubble. And I've had a lot of questions as to what it was underneath it, but uh, nobody guessed it exactly. So the background there and what you're seeing is not what this looked like when I shot it. And uh, when you go to the next shot, Scott, we'll show them what, uh, what we were seeing out of the camera. This is the actual shot as it looked when we were shooting it. Um, there's not really much of anything changed on this at all. When you're shooting these frozen bubbles outside, you'll see them online. Some of the best color you get is if you have the light, whether it's sunlight or artificial light behind the bubble, or at least off to the side. Mm -hmm. Well, this was kind of a good day, so I didn't have that luxury. So I brought in some artificial light, a little LED light. In fact, Carol was talking about them, those little Lytra lights. Yeah. Okay. They have the diffusers on them. Something like that is what you could use for this, which I have my wife uh, patiently holding for me uh, off to the side. And uh, this is what it looked like in the camera, but I knew I had something when I got a little bit of sharpness on it. And if you take a look at the next shot, we can switch to that. Yeah. So this is your setup? This is the setup. Yeah, so there's a bit of setup here. There's a bit of work going on. When you're shooting 
for frozen uh, soap bubbles outside, you typically want to put them on top of snow. So you can just blow your bubbles right onto the snow. In this case, I wanted something kind of at eye level. So I just found a step ladder that I had and I put some snow on top of it. I had chilled okay. the bubble solution for a little bit. So that was cold. And all I have going on there is a light stand with a little paper background behind it, the SLR with a macro lens. Mm -hmm. And um, the light that's coming in from the side, the bubble's not there right now. Right. And I think the next one I'm going to show them what was actually uh, um, underneath the bubble. Yeah. So that's actually the, the stopper, a glass stopper from a decanter. So get creative. Have oh, fun. Okay. You can find stuff all over your house to do these wild things with. Your friends and neighbors will think you're you're kind of crazy, but that's part of the fun, I think. I don't know. <laughs> uh, Peeking over the fence. Sometimes, sometimes like that. <laughs> So the interesting thing about that, uh, then, is that wasn't sitting on top of the, exactly straight the way I wanted it. So I just uh -huh. went with it. You know, it started to freeze a little bit, moved off to the side, and I actually liked the composition that way. So we, we kind of went with it. Yeah. And the cool thing, the <laughs> no pun intended, the way we got that color is we simply, this was shot in RAW, not as a JPEG. Mm -hmm. You can change the white balance yeah. when you shoot RAW images, almost like it's you're still there. I played around with the white balance slider until I got the blue cool tones that I wanted and done. So it's just like, like tell it you're doing move the, tungsten. Or move whatever. the slider that says temperature control yeah. for, you know, for your white balance until you see what you like and you're done. Yeah. So that's how we got that blue color. Nice. Yep. All right. So from one complicated setup to another complicated setup, <laughs> yeah, just for the fun of it, we show we figured to show you a real wacky one. Um, when we first started to be indoors for quite a long period of time through this this long year that past year that we've had, I thought I'm going to have some fun with projects, and that one uh, was one that uh, took quite a while to create. Nope. My screen share just dropped. Yeah, it did. There we go. Coming back. There we go. Now it's back. <laughs> All right, so. What are we looking at? Well, this is how it all started. What you're seeing there is the lemon and the lime, a real lemon and a real lime. And you're seeing an LED light pad, like somebody, some people would look at slides on, or this is actually uh, my wife. She was nice enough to loan it to me. She uses it for a lot of her art projects. Okay. And uh, yeah. those, those two little kind of alligator clip things, we call them third hands, and there's a wire going across. So that's kind of where the brainstorm started with getting uh, making a lemon and a lime look like it was being shuffled into one another. And this was kind of the beginning of the setup. And if you go too quick to the next one, you'll see how it progressed. <laughs> this is what it looks like before we put it into the light tent. This is another light tent shot, guys. Uh, lots of fun with those. And what you're seeing hanging there are monofilaments or fishing line, fancy mm -hmm. term for fishing line. And there's some toothpicks kind of holding it all together. This is what food photographers use, whatever's at their disposal. And then those little round things, those beads, is just kind of a way that we're stopping the, the monofilament from pulling through the rind of the fruit. Tying a knot in it wasn't working very well without harming it. So we just had some jewelry beads there that we did uh, for the monofilament. You'll see the lights coming from the bottom. And then we have two more shots. We're going to go to the next to last shot there which is going to be, here's what it looks like in the light tent. And this is basically the final shot before we did some editing. Mm -hmm. You can see the two kind of sticking out and, and you can see the wires a little bit. Yeah. And then if we move, go ahead, Scott. Yep. And then, and then there's the last shot after we did some cloning and some, some fancy removal of stuff in Photoshop. And you have yourself a several hours long project if you want to do that kind of crazy stuff. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that would definitely keep you busy. <laughs> that would keep me busy. Yeah, it kept me for several but, hours. Yeah. But it's a great, like, okay, I'm going to try to come up with this, and you've got to work through the problem solving and work through the steps of, okay, now how do I solve this problem? Okay, in solving that, I created this other problem for myself. How do I fix that? Yep. And the best advice I could give people is when you come up with a wacky idea like this, it may not be what you do in the long run. Sometimes it is like this is pretty much how I envision this from the get go. Not exactly. But mm -hmm. have, you know, you, every, have faith in your intuition. We, we know more how to problem solve for photography than and in art than we realize. So get an idea, write them down before they get lost and have fun with your photo projects.
Yeah, absolutely. So take a little time and like play around with stuff. It's the, exactly. it's the best way to learn stuff, right? Like just poke around at things and see what you can do with it. Poke around and do it, you know, give it, give it a shot. If you fail, that's just getting you to the next step of getting something else fun, you know, down the road. Right. Not too many crazy, crazy good things were developed without uh, a lot of failure along the way. So. <laughs> and a lot of the things we're talking about, we have on sale. So the, the, the tabletop studio tents are on sale. The lightras are on sale. Uh, tripods, remote shutter releases. There's so many close-up macro things that are on sale through, uh, you know, for the next little bit. Yeah, I remember we were sitting around coming up like, okay, people are inside. They're looking for something. Like, what can we give them that's going to help them out? And this is kind of what we came up with. Uh, and it's yeah. so much fun to just tinker with this stuff. You can kind of, like, I don't know about other people. I really enjoy the the sort of MacGyver process of coming up with, like, how am I going to rig this thing up? Or I love your your containers. Okay, now I can see the reflection, so I'm going to wrap them in black felt and then, like, kind of working through craft, this problem. Craft store, 99 cents for some pieces of craft, black felt, wrap them around, problem solved. And, and, yeah. and it kind of works that way. You just inch by inch. You work your way into, you know, what your vision was in the first place, or maybe something a little bit different than your vision, but nonetheless, probably something fun in the long run. Yeah. That's what we shoot, you know, to have fun, a lot of us. All right. Well, I think that's about going to wrap it up for this week's edition of the photo show. Thanks so much. This was a lot of fun. Uh, once again, thank you, Phil, for sharing all this stuff and going through all that process with us. Thank you Pleasure. to... Joan, who's joined us, and I'm going to throw you guys back in the chat to say goodbye for the evening. <laughs> Bye. Thanks so much for joining us. Bye, it's ladies. been a lot of fun. Bye, ladies. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <You're> <laughs> and thank you so much. It's been great. Uh, if you have questions, if you have comments, uh, you can post them in the chat. This The video is going to be up for you to rewatch whenever. Um, we will be posting some more notes and following up, but... Uh, Please, by all means, go follow our guests this week. Uh, follow the, the wildlife photography and the tiny plastic people. <laughs> oh, there's the little raft. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Tiny raft. <laughs> and if you're into wildlife photography at all, join us again next week. We've got a special guest coming in to talk about all kinds of great stuff. Uh, that's going to be another interesting episode. Uh, and until then. Uh, keep taking pictures, play around with stuff, have fun, share them in our Facebook group. Uh, I know both of you, Joan and Carol, are active in that Facebook group. If you want to get in touch with them, I know you'll be able to find them in there. And uh, thanks so much, everybody. It's been a lot of fun. We'll see you next time. Thank you. See you next time.